one. We'll read the first three verses aloud together, and then I'll read a few more verses and begin to look at things more closely. Chapter 13, reading from verse 1. Now the church that was at Antioch, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menon, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And I'll, I'll continue on. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through uh, the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet of Jews, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the, so the sorcerer, so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around work seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul, hallelujah, believed. When he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now when Paul and his party sent sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returned to Jerusalem. I'll go back to the beginning now. The beginning of Paul's missionary journeys, you can look in the back of most of your Bibles, there are maps there of the, the area, the Mediterranean area in, in the New Testament times, Old Testament as well. But you can look there and you see these various cities and where they're located. The city of Antioch in Syria was a very important Syri city. Uh, it's the third largest city in the Roman Empire at this time, behind Rome and Alexandria, Egypt, which I didn't realize how Alexandria was a big city. It's very important in terms of theology. Uh, the Jewish scholars at Alexandria had translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek way before Jesus was born. Interesting about that. It's called the Septuagint, and much of our Old Testament is based on that translation. And so there were, there were Hebrew and Greek scholars there at Alexandria, Egypt, which when you look on the maps, it's northern Egypt. And then, and then Antioch. Antioch was a city of about a half million people. That's pretty large. So Rome, Alexandria, and Egypt, and, and Antioch are the largest cities in ancient Rome. Except for Jerusalem, Antioch played a large part in the life of the early Christian church than any other city of the Roman Empire. It became the birthplace of foreign missions as Paul used Antioch, the Antioch church, as a base of operations for his missionary tours into Asia Minor, Asia Minor being Turkey as we know it today. So that's the setting, and uh, Paul and Barnabas, are, they, they've been to Jerusalem, now they, they came back to Antioch, and we, we read earlier where it was at this Antioch that uh, people were first called Christians, or followers of the Lord, and so, that, that, that stuck from then on. So, uh, but that's where it began, in the city of Antioch, Syria. So we see in the opening verses here how uh, through, through some other prophets uh, that were assigned to tell Paul and his companions 
that this is what the Holy, Holy Spirit was calling them to do. Uh, certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manon, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Uh, Herod the Tetrarch, it's interesting about that, he was of the family of the Herods, and they were notorious for their viciousness and their opposition to Jesus. A tetrarch was the, the ruler under Roman rule. The Romans allowed the Jews to have their own king over their own affairs. And he, he was a ruler over a fourth part of the kingdom. So Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, I, I remember when, when Joseph and Mary were coming back out of Egypt a, after they escaped the slaughter of the infants. You remember that? When Herod the Great had ordered every boy two years old and younger to be killed because he, he was afraid of this, this Jewish king who was Jesus uh, was going to overthrow his throne. He was a very jealous man. So he had them all killed. That, that was Herod the Great. Well, Herod the Tetrarch was a successor of his. And then when they came out of Egypt to go back to Nazareth, they, they avoided going through Jerusalem because of this guy. Now, it's interesting how this prophet of God was uh, early on in life uh, associated with him in some way. <clears throat> he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, so apparently they, they were like classmates. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul, for the work for which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So we see the, these prophets uh, ha having the authority to do that, to lay hands on, to ordain them into ministry. And then uh, by the Holy Spirit's direction and prompting, they, they pray for them, lay their hands on them, that ordering them into service, and then they sent them away. So being sent out, verse 4, by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salome, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had also had John as their assistant, and that was John Mark, we find out later, that's Barnabas' nephew. And so he was with them in his early missionary journey, and then, uh, and then uh, Paul and, uh, and Barnabas. Now, when they'd gone through, verse 6, the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bargesus, who was with a proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of the God, word of God. And we read back in uh, chapters 10 and 11 how another Gentile had come to know the Lord through Peter's ministry. You remember that? how God had given Peter a vision and then sent him uh, to this Roman centurion. And uh, that, that Roman centurion was a, a, a just man, it said. He, he, he was well known among the Jews. He, he, he contributed to the Jewish ministry and, and he, he was a kind man, but he, he was seeking the Lord. He didn't have full knowledge of the Lord. He only knew the Lord as much as he was learning about the from the Old Testament writings. But God provides for him full salvation. He sends Peter to him. He preaches the gospel. The man's whole household gets saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see that in the book of Acts when the church is spreading. And sometimes, like Paul later will read in the 16th chapter, I think, uh, where he's imprisoned at Philippi in northern Greece. And... Uh, Remember, God delivers from that, and then the, the Roman jailer is going to commit suicide because uh, all the doors of the prison were unlocked. No, no prisoners escaped. Nobody escaped. It's interesting. Paul says, don't do that. No, no, everybody's still here. But see, his head was on the line because he had been guilty of allowing those prisoners to escape. And so in that, he asked Paul, and I'm paraphrasing this very loosely, he asked Paul what he must do to be saved. And so then Paul preaches the gospel to him and says, and the, this jailer, he and his whole household got saved. Everybody got saved. 
there's, there's a principle in that that we can apply in our lives, and it's not 100%, but we can, we, can, we can bank on the promise that if we're faithful at our end in raising our children right and doing our best with them and instilling in them the principles of the Bible, that even if they stray away, and I, I'm guilty of this, I was a prodigal in our family, even if they stray away, if we're faithful and pray for them, very often, not 100%, but very often they'll come back. And so if you're praying for a loved one or a kid that's messing up, hang in there. Keep praying. And, and I, I'm just testimony sitting here today that I strayed all through my 20s. I, I, I left the faith, so to speak. My parents kept praying for me, standing on the scriptures to train up a child. And the way he should go, when he grows old, he'll not depart from that way. And a series of circumstances have brought me back. And, and uh, so I, I'm just an example of the miracle of that verse. And I, I think probably some of you guys are too. Don't give up. The Word of God is powerful, living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to, to cut through the bone and the marrow, the soul and the spirit, and laying bare, laying bare the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's a sharp sword, man. It's talking about the Word of God, talking about the Bible. And it does. It, it just lays open all that stuff that we have, and it cuts through all of our arguments against the Lord and bears them, lays them out there, and now we're left with a decision, either accept God and, or keep running from Him. And when we accept Him, He forgives all of our sins. That's cool stuff, man. That is cool. And so this pro-counsel now, an intelligent man, he, uh, he had an important office there in, in Antioch, Syria, uh, which was a Roman bastion too, by the way. It's a beautiful city. It was even referred to as the Paris of the Middle East. So the, the Romans in Herod uh, had really uh, built that city and made it beautiful. And, and uh, it, it was on a river and near the coast. And so a very important city. And the Romans had uh, their headquarters there. Hence the proconsuls there. But this false prophet uh, trying to mess with God's program. <laughs> and it reminds me of another case. And I forget which chapter it is. But uh, where uh, this the, the, it says the seven sons of Sceva, S-C-E-V-A, they, they were sons of a priest. And they, they thought that they were going to cast the, uh, the demon out of this one guy. And the demon speaks to him. Remember this? Yeah. Well, if you don't remember, I'll tell you. So they're trying to. They're, they're, they're praying. And uh, the, the demon speaks to him and says, Paul, I know. And Jesus I know, but who are you? Then it says he jumps on him, beats him up, and strips him naked. Seven guys, one demon possessed guy. And so you better know that you're operating in the power of the Holy Spirit if you're going to mess with a demoniac. Amen. And I'm going to tell you there are people that are demon possessed. I don't see a demon in everybody. I don't see a demon behind every bush like some do. You see demons everywhere. We know this. When we, know, when we read the Bible, we know that Satan is lurking behind every bad thing that's going on in our world. 19, chapter 19, verse 15. Uh, uh, oh, okay, chapter 19. Okay, yeah, we're not there yet, so uh, you'll remember when we get there next time. Uh, yeah, so you better know that you're operating in the power of the Spirit. Another thing, too, and I've been mentioning this a lot because I'm really uh, amazed at the Chosen series. Uh, but when Nicodemus uh, tried to remove the demons from Mary Magdalene, you remember this in, in the Chosen? And uh, he, had, he had a heart. No, Nicodemus had a heart. And he was just amazed at her. And he had a heart for her, but he couldn't do anything for her. And then later he sees her, and she, she's smiling, and she's 
She's leading a normal life, and he's just in awe. What happened to this girl? And uh, Jesus cast the seven demons out of her, and she was a, a totally changed woman. And so later, Nicodemus becomes a believer. Uh, so God works in wondrous ways. We can't predict how he works. The Elements of Sorcery, verse 8, chapter 13. For so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, verse 10, and, and I want to tell you something right now. Sometimes the apostles hit hard. Uh, Paul was bold. I, I don't know if, if I would say some of these words to somebody because I'm fearful that I might uh, be attacked. I'm talking about me or anybody else, perhaps. But Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, one of the purposes in the filling of the Holy Spirit is boldness to be his witnesses. And that means boldness even to the point of death to being a martyr for the faith. And most of the apostles were martyred for the faith. They were killed for their faith. So they had that power, and the power came from the Holy Spirit, and they were sold out to the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, he says, O, o full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? That's pretty heavy language, man. That, that would offend some sensibilities of people today. This uh, hate speech stuff. You know, he would be called a hate speecher. But he laid it on. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then, this is an amen and praise the Lord. Verse 12. Then the proconsul believed. When he saw what had been done, the miracle, and then being astonished, at the teaching uh, of the Lord. So two things, the miracle, the physical miracle, and then the teaching of the Word of God. Verse 13, And when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Verse 14, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia. Now, now this is the other Antioch, and this is uh, in Turkey. Today's Turkey. So Antioch, Pisidia, or Pisidian Antioch. And went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. You'll notice as we go through the book of Acts and other places that the, the, the Jewish uh, disciples and prophets uh, always went into the synagogues. They, they, the synagogue met on the Sabbath day. And so they, they would go in, and very often a visiting uh, apostle or whatever would be asked to stand up and speak. And so they were faithful in going into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. Verse 15, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue said to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on, say it, speak up. Then Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, and said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. I was talking to some people, friends of ours, recently. They came over from Arizona uh, and had dinner with them. And, and uh, he said, Why would anybody fear God? He says, We're not supposed to fear God. I said, Well, there's a good fear. Do you know that? And I didn't elaborate on the, the, how we would fear God, and that's be a good thing. And I should have, I didn't. But I just use the illustration of sometimes just in the natural, there, there's, a, I think, a fear that's built in us. I'll give you an example. I do not like heights. Anybody here like heights? See? <laughs> oh, there's one back there who likes heights. I'm going to take you up on top of a mountain, and I'm going to act like I'm going to shove you. You're not going to like heights anymore. That's what happened to me. 
this prankster friend of mine, I almost whipped him, boy, I'm telling you, because we were at Estes Park in Colorado, and we over, there were no barriers or handrails in those days, a long time ago. And he acted like he was going to push me. And the river looked this wide down there. It's a long way. It scared me. And I threatened that guy to beat him. You know, said, don't you touch me again. But ever since then, I've had, what's it called, acrophobia? Yeah. I've had that. So don't you get me near anything that's high without a handrail in front of me. And even then, I get a little squeamish. Up in high buildings, really, I do. I, I can look over the rail, and I enjoy the view, but I, I get this sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's a good fear so I don't do something stupid. Like this guy at Vesuvius recently. You read about this? He was taking a selfie, and he went down in the Mount Vesuvius in Italy, and uh, on an area where it's not uh, made for the tourists to walk. They got a, a place where there is for tourists to walk and a handrail. This guy went over to the other side. He's taking selfie and he falls down into the, into the, fortunately he didn't get down into where it's really would have burned him up. So they were able to rescue him with very little injuries. But this dummy, I call him dummy. <laughs> Volcanoes have hot lava down inside. Plus, it was high, and he fell down in it, in the cone. And so, forgive me, Lord, for calling him a dummy, but he was. Anyway, are you understanding what I'm saying here? My point is, there's a good fear that will keep us from doing something stupid. And so it goes with our fear of the Lord. If we learn how to fear the Lord pro properly, not that we're... You know, some of us grew up in churches where we're always afraid that God is going to beat us up because he's mean. Remember that? Uh, like I, I joke about, I used to get saved every Sunday because I wasn't sure I was saved, you know. So God was portrayed as kind of mean-spirited. But when you read the t entirety of Scripture, you realize he was not. He is a just God, so he has to punish. But uh, he's a fair God as well. So... When we properly understand his nature, then we fear him out of respect, not out of intimidation. Like my dad was a boxer. He he had 107 fights as an amateur. So us boys, there's three of us, uh, we knew we couldn't handle the old man. I'm going to tell you that. He could whoop us. But he never did. He never touched us. And our fear of him was not so much out of that, even though you know he could whoop us. But he, he demanded our respect in the way he treated us. And so our fear was we didn't want to offend Dad. We didn't want to offend Mom. That was the fear. We don't want to offend our God, our Father, who has delivered us from all this insanity that we lent ourselves to. Amen? That's a healthy fear. That's the fear that is being spoken of here. Okay, now Paul gets into a discourse here, and I'm not going to read much of this, because this is a long chapter, by the way. Uh, starting with verse 17, I penciled in my margin history. When I went through chapter 7, when we were reading about Stephen, the first martyr of the church, he gives a discourse in chapter 7, I believe it is, and he just traces the history of the Jews from their imprisonment for 400 years in Egypt through the wanderings in the wilderness to the, establishing themselves in the land of Canaan. And all those, in an overview fashion, he gave the history of the Jews, the delivering through the Red Sea and so on. And in that, the, the Jewish leadership of the day were, were convicted to their hearts about how hypocritical they were. And they really were angry with him. You remember that. Said so they gnashed their teeth at him. And some think they actually bit him, and that's possible. They did a Mike Tyson. If you don't know who Mike Tyson is, just forget it. Just pass over it. Look it up in Wikipedia or whatever. Anyway. <laughs> he was a boxer, and one time he was having a struggle with this guy. He's used to dominating people, and he bit the guy's ear. Bit a portion of it off. <laughs> 
So anyway, they were gnashing their teeth at, at Stephen, and whether they were bodying him or not, they, we don't know. But one of the commentators said they're gnashing their teeth, and and sometimes if we experience severe pain, we'll grind our teeth. You know, well, their pain is their anger and their 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 anger against Paul was so great, or Stephen in that case. They were gnashing their teeth. That's heavy-duty anger. And so much so that they killed him. And it was illegal for the Jews to institute capital punishment under the Roman law. They did it anyway. And so they killed Stephen, the first martyr. But, but Stephen was beautiful. He, he said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then uh, he says, and I, and I love this, he says, as he was dying, he saw a vision. He says, I saw Jesus standing in the right hand of God. Well, most of the time when rabbis taught, they sat. Well, Jesus is the master rabbi. Some commentators, commentators think this, and I, and I think it's possible. Can't make a doctrine out of it. But it's possible that when every Christian gets to heaven, that's going to happen. Jesus is going to stand up and say, come on in, you belong. I love that. That was true of Stephen. Yeah, he was a martyr. He, he, was a, he was a deacon in the early church. He was a preacher of the gospel. He was all those things. But all of us are equally saved. We may not have the same office or do the same things that somebody else did, but we're all equally saved. Jesus shed his blood for all of us equally. I think he's going to stand up and say, come on in. We belong there. Amen? Amen. And that, that gave me comfort about Jolene's going home. I, I just know that she was welcomed in heaven. Amen. Amen? And you will be too when you get there. Okay. If you... <laughs> I'm kidding, kind of, but I, you know, I don't know if everybody sitting here is, is born again or not. If you're not, I'm going to give you an invitation here in just a few minutes to make that decision. Uh, but the, the history that Paul begins to outline now is a little bit different than Stephen's but still, it's an overview, and if you, if you remember the reading of the Old Testament accounts, you know this is a, a good overview of their history. And I won't go through all of it, but reading from verse 17, The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. Now, he covered a lot of territory there. They were there 400 years, so... Uh, he left a lot out, but he says, ultimately, they were brought out of that and the slavery that they experienced there, the, the whole nation of Israel. Now, for a time, about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. Remember that? They, they, they griped about everything. They, they had short memories. They, they, they were de delivered miraculously through the Red Sea and uh, then God drowned the Egyptians in the waters that came back in on them after he brought the Israelites through on dry land in the Red Sea. And about a month later, they were griping. Oh, we don't have enough water. We can't find drinking water. Well, they came upon bad water. But God made provisions to make the water right. And then they griped about not having enough food. And they, they, they said, they, they griped. It, we should have been, we should have stayed in Egypt because back there we had onions and, and so on to eat and, and we had uh, meat to eat and they didn't. They were slaves. Anyway, they're, they're saying all this. They're griping at God. They're griping at Moses who was God's representative. And so God says, I'm paraphrasing. He says, you want meat? I'm going to give you meat. And he sent them quail. And it says, he gave them such a craving for quail that they gorged themselves so much that the meat came out their nostrils. You better be careful when you're messing with God. You, you might get a whole lot more than you want. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Now, I, I guess quail's pretty good eating. I never hunted quail. I hunted pheasant back home. And pheasant was, ooh, that's good eating. It's done right. I'm, I'm sure quail is too. But so they got meat, but then after that, God gave them manna, remember? They didn't like that either. Oh, just, all we get is manna, manna, manna. And uh, they wanted something else. 
They were gripers. They were complainers. They, uh, God said that at one time they were stiff-necked people. And I understand stiff necks because I've got one. And sometimes it's because of my own, my own behavior. <laughs> and other times it's just this arthritis thing. You know what I'm saying? But no, their stiff neck, their stiff neckness uh, was against God, and they just disagreed with his ways. And then remember when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments and they started partying at the foot of the mountain? And Paul, I think, is going to outline a lot of that. I'm going to stop here because we have communion. And so I'm going to pray. I'll close this portion of the service. And in doing this, if there's anybody here this morning that's never received Jesus, uh, and, and I, I just want you to know we're, we're right here. We're ready to pray with you if you want to do that, if you want to make that decision. And by the way, it's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life because it means eternal life or eternal death. Amen. And, uh, you know, the more I, I deal in hospitals and with death, like with my wife, the more I realize that we were created to be immortal beings, never to die. Humans were never meant to die. We were meant to live eternally. We were made in the origins and the image and likeness of God who is eternal. God made a provision to restore us to that. That's through Jesus. See, But I see the bodies fighting death off when, when there's, there's no hope. And I see that in hospitals, even with my wife, fighting off death when it seems to be hopeless. But that just tells me we were made to be immortal. But there's a promise in that as well for the true believer. That this struggle now is going to be lightweight stuff as we look back in eternity and we're there forever, pain-free forever. You understand what I'm saying here? Beautiful stuff. So if that describes you this morning and you want us to pray with you, please raise your hand and put it right back down again. We want to pray with you. Anyone at all? I don't know anybody's heart here, or any. You know, I know some of you. You've been here a long time. Anybody that's followed Jesus, and you, you quit. You quit following him. You you still believe, but you you're having a hard time. And that's that's kind of the, the backslider or the prodigal son or daughter. You know, there's a story in Luke's. Luke chapter 15, I believe it is, about the prodigal son. I want you to know something. If you're a prodigal, God's looking for you to come back, and he is not ticked off at you. He wants you to come back so he can hug you and say, come on back. You, you were once dead to me, and now you're alive. A lot of, a lot of backsliders think that God's mad at him. He's going to whoop up on him. He's not, not going to do that. He's going to be so happy you came to your senses and you came home. Anybody in that that might describe this morning. Father, we thank you for our great salvation and how great that is when we really think it through. Thank you so much now as we go to the table, the memorial table, remembering what Jesus accomplished for us with the cross. May, may we honor you in this ceremony and may we be blessed, Lord, as we do that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just please come out of your seats, come down, and the elements are here on the platter on the table. You know, there's a lot of good songs that are appropriate to communion, and that's one of my favorites. There are others that are equal to it, but this is sung by Barry McGuire. You've got to be pretty old to know who he was. He was a singer with a popular group in the day, the New Christie Minstrels, and he was their lead singer. <clears throat> he got saved, and man, when he got saved, he was like the Apostle Paul. He really got saved, and so I, I'm going to recommend this. You, you can get it uh, online, probably Amazon. The title of the album is To the Bride. It's a concert where in between the songs, he just kind of, ministers, uh, principles from the Bible, and so on. It's just excellent. 
and then the band and the singers with him. It's, it's a concert. But it's one of my favorite albums, Christian albums of all time. It's just a moving thing. I recommend it if you're interested at all. And uh, you, you can hear his voice, and you might not like his vocal styling, but if you do, it's a good voice. Amen? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. Take this bread, he says in singing that lyric. It's my body, which is given for you. And the Apostle Paul writes in the 23rd verse of 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you'll proclaim the Lord's death till he comes and so when we do this it's just affirming his promise that he's going to come back and take us to himself again and so when we do communion it's kind of a prophetic thing we're doing here this is a new thing that was established that Passover supper night that Jesus experienced with the disciples that time. There was a change happening that night. The old covenant or agreement between God and man was transitioning into a new covenant, a new relationship, a new, a new uh, agreement between God and man, and God always initiates. So it's a better covenant. In the book of Hebrews, which I started teaching Wednesday night, by the way. All the way through the book of Hebrews, it looks back on the Old Testament procedures and it says this new one, this new covenant is a better covenant. You and I are privileged to be a part under the better covenant. We don't have to try to fulfill the Ten Commandments 100%, although we should do our best to live a holy life. Yes, the Bible teaches that. But we know it's impossible to be absolutely perfect. And if there's anybody who thinks they are, you're deceived. <laughs> but Jesus did. He never sinned. He fulfilled all Ten Commandments and everything prescribed through Moses to the children of Israel. And so he's the only one qualified to die in our place. And he did that, and that's what this is all about. What we're about to do is in remembrance of what he did for us. And so we take the bread. And verse 24 says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And right now as we get ready to take the bread together, uh, I'll pray, and then we'll take together, and then we'll move on to the cup as we wrap up our service this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so privileged to be your adopted sons and daughters. What an amazing thing it is. Like the pro council was amazed at what he had seen and heard. And Father, I'm still amazed at what I see and hear when I see the transformation of lives that seem to be impossible to be transformed, but they are. And they stay in, in step with Jesus. And that's why we gather together. That's one of the reasons why we're called to, to be together. Uh, Jesus designed church fellowship for that purpose, that, to help each other and build each other up. To stir each other up, each other up to love and good works. The way we do that is to be together 
And COVID interfered with that, but now we're together again. So for that, we're thankful. And now, Lord, as we take this bread, we remember that great salvation and sacrifice because he loved us so much. And you, through your son, Jesus, we know you love us, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take. Verse 25 says, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, and then the promise, which I love. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And I don't don't think sometimes we realize that, yet we, we know most of us here, we, we're, we're born again, and we know what the Bible teaches. But it's a fresh proclamation that we share together. The Lord's going to come back again. He promised that. And so it says, when you, when you drink this cup, you'll proclaim the Lord's death till he returns. So you and I are preachers of the gospel, in effect, when we do this. Amen? So let's take the cup. And I thank whoever peeled my cup back for me. Uh, People take care of me all the time because I I have a tendency to spill these dumb things when I try to peel that cover off. So I'm going to move away from the table. (laughs) They they took the cloth off last time I I spilled on it. And, you know, grape juice is hard to get out. Anyway, so they took the cup after supper, Sam. So let's pray, and then we'll take together, and then we'll sing a a final song and uh, go to lunch. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the new covenant. Your your scriptures, as we study them in the Old Testament, there are several covenants that kind of overlap that you, you, you struck with different people that you chose, different leaders that you chose for the national Israel. Father, (coughs) those covenants kind of overlap right down to this final covenant and this this sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. The book of Hebrews says it was a once-for-all sacrifice. Under the old covenant, they had to sacrifice a lot of animals daily and monthly and weekly and, and annually. But Jesus, being the Lamb of God, representative of all those animal sacrifices, wrapped up into one human being that never sinned. Father, that was it. No more sacrifices. That was sufficient for all time, for all people. The Bible says, the book of Hebrews says, He died once for all. He died once. We don't have to re-sacrifice Him. He died once. That's sufficient. That satisfied your anger against us. You lifted that off of us. You declared us to be your children. We thank you for that as we take this cup now in Jesus' name. Amen.